Yeah. All right, okay. Sorry. Uh, but maybe, Neil, you can tell us uh, all about this, this the situation with your party and uh, uh, its relationship with the European issue and so on. Sure. And, uh, and of course, we're particularly concerned at this last minute about the citizens, EU citizens, which you've done this wonderful, this great letter to the Prime Minister. I don't know whether you've had any response yet, but uh, no, <laughs> I didn't expect you had. But uh, have you, at least it's rallied a, a few of the troops together on it, and we appreciate your efforts for that. So Thank maybe you. you could let, have a bit of a chat and then we'll have a discussion, a bit of a discussion. Sure thing. Well, in terms of, um joining the Alba party or Alba party, which is also fine. It's just the English pronunciation. I don't think we all, uh, we don't say Paris every time we say Paris. So um, uh, I'm quite agnostic about uh, how people um, choose to pronounce it. Um, in terms of uh, that, that move, uh, as you'll all know, I was elected as an independent MP um, for circumstances that were well publicized and um, and are thankfully behind me, I would hope. Um, but uh, uh, although I rejoined the SNP, um, there were circumstances within the, the party uh, that I was very uncomfortable about. Uh, there was a, 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 a really quite a, a challenging environment. And so the opportunity to um, continue with the same basic principles in uh, a, a separate party uh, was alluring for a variety of reasons which I'll not go into because it's so unhelpful and uh, but, but in terms of your interest um, I would say that uh, you know we remain and I certainly remain very pro-Europe um, I think we have a slightly nuanced uh, and more transparent position on Europe which is that um, uh, the, uh, the, the potential benefits of EFTA membership should be explored um, uh, and that the decision should be taken by the people about what um, future we pursue. Now, EFTA membership could be done reasonably swiftly uh, and that would correct many of the problems uh, that we currently uh, are experiencing in Brexit Britain, um, and it would then allow us to have a conversation about full membership and allow us to prepare for that. So uh, I, I still believe overwhelmingly that the Scottish people will support rejoining the EU. I don't think that there's much doubt in my mind that that would be the outcome of any, um, any process towards EU membership. Um, the real concern is how we deal with the not just the challenges of Brexit, but the new challenges that are being presented with the free trade agreement with Australia, for example, uh, and the impact that that may have on the sustainability of um, farming in the first instance. But I think there will be wider implications. Uh, my uh, thoughts on the FTA with Australia are that um, we've actually secured a trade deal that delivers what we don't need rather than a trade deal that delivers what we do need. Most of the um, activity that was impacted by Brexit was service industry based, whether that's banking or uh, other related industries. And uh, that doesn't solve any of, of those um, challenges uh, in any regard. This is mainly a goods um, deal, there are, um, I think, some limited opportunities to improve uh, travel, but we're finding more out about the FTA from Canberra than we are from our own government. And that was that message was made loud and clear uh, uh, on several occasions today in the chamber. Um, and, you know, it, it really does um, set us a, a considerable disadvantage, not least by the fact that we don't really know what the trade deal con contains, but what, what we do know about it um, will have a, a, a serious impact for an incredibly small amount of, of um, uh, trade gain, if you like. The, the, 
the, the predictions are of 0.02% of growth, and that's over 15 years. So we're talking uh, about a drop in the ocean. It doesn't solve any of the economic impact challenges that we have uh, coming out of Europe. And um, some of the industries that have been most profoundly hit, particularly shellfish uh, exports from Scotland uh, into the European market. So that, that's really, um, you know, the oyster and langoustine um, uh, operations, uh, which are excluded from importation because as a third country, the legislation that the UK signed up to as a member excludes the importation of uh, shellfish completely. So we, we are bound by rules that we set and that that was not either recognised or um, challenged as part of the exit negotiations is a, a real dereliction of responsibility on behalf of the UK government um, and it has left that industry uh, in a, an incredibly challenging hiatus about what to do next and you know uh, unless we are going to fly those products to um, Australia uh, because of the requirement to keep them fresh and the, the desirability that they are fresh uh, I think that it'd be very difficult for that market to absorb the type of um, uh, activity that was previously being enjoyed with European and countries. Australia has masses of oysters and lobsters and all sorts yeah. of things. That it's more likely to send them to us than the other way around, I think. Indeed, and, and that is true of lamb and beef as well. So um, it, it's a really uncomfortable uh, position to be in, um, and it will be a very difficult uh, challenge to recover from if some of our worst fears do uh, do transpire. Um, in terms of the EU settlement scheme, I, I was very fortunate to work with um, partner organisations in drafting the letter and making, I think, what was a very strong case uh, for um, a, a comprehensive uh, uh, change to the uh, cutoff date for applications. Um, and we, many members, spoke very uh, passionately um, recently about their concerns uh, as we approach the uh, the deadline. Um, I, I hate to be uh, pessimistic. Uh, it's not in my nature to be pessimistic. I'm a generally very optimistic, can-do kind of person. Um, but the I think the UK government have um, made it abundantly clear. Uh, on a fairly regular basis that um, they don't really do listening um, and they don't really do negotiation and they don't really do scrutiny by parliament as we saw with the reduction in foreign aid uh, last week the refusal of uh, a, a meaningful vote um, and uh, you know I, I think the way that they've approached the COVID crisis uh, over the last year and a half has also been uh, largely problematic because of their unwillingness to listen to other voices. Uh, uh, you know, and the, the level of chaos that was described by Dominic Cummings and the uh, rancor that existed in number 10 has only been, sadly, been confirmed um, by the release of WhatsApp messages that show exactly the kind of tit-for-tat um, schoolboy nonsense that is going on at the heart of government. And it's incredibly dispiriting that, uh, that we are being led by that kind of politic. Uh, it, it, it's really hard to grasp, and um, no matter how grown up we try to be, uh, as a, a parliament in challenging government uh, about these issues, um, we seem to get very little traction. Um, if I give you a, a, what I think is a, 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 an example of um, real and pressing need in May of last year, I wrote uh, to the Prime Minister with the support of many parliamentarians and uh, um, from both houses of parliament around the PPE scandal 
that was uh, impacting on safe practice in the NHS. Uh, it took over six months to get any response and the response came from a minister. I wrote to the prime minister and I got a response from Joe Churchill and Joe's a, she's a really nice person. Um, uh, but the response was completely inadequate, uh, you know, six months later to say we take this issue seriously um, really, <laughs> really undermines the message that was contained in the in the letter in, of response. So uh, if if we don't get uh, meaningful responses, um, uh, we don't get meaningful. Well, I certainly haven't had meaningful responses in the chamber. I don't get meaningful responses often from written parliamentary questions. A lot of the uh, responses to my letters come back and they explain to me government policy rather than answering the question that I've asked. Uh, so it's, a, it's an extremely dispiriting circumstance, but I don't believe that we should, uh, any of us should um, uh, refrain from continuing to make these really important cases. Uh, and certainly um, it, it's something that um, I will continue to do uh, for however long I remain a member of parliament. And, um, you know, uh, as the third wave of the pandemic now approaches us and we are seeing, uh, we, we are still seeing uh, a relaxed, sometimes indifferent attitude from government about how to manage that, and we have uh, a, a relaxed uh, and sometimes and very sadly indifferent attitude to the independence question from the Scottish government. Um, I really despair about how we make a, a meaningful bid to, to get back into Europe soon. Um, I think our prospectus uh, uh, as a party didn't cut through for a variety of different reasons uh, about emboldening the Scottish Parliament. There were, I think, quite obvious personal um, reasons for that between um, the Alp Party's leadership and the SNP's leadership. But uh, it's very hard to get a message across when you are completely blacked out from uh, broadcast media uh, as we were. Um, but that, you know, again, you know, it would be easy for me to go and say, oh, gosh, it's not fair. But uh, again, it's not my nature to do that. We've just got to push ahead and continue to try to make the case. And I've been uh, in my new position. I've ha I have the freedom to pursue some of these issues much more vigorously than I would have been able to do within the SNP group. And certainly some of those issues um, I was actively dissuaded from pursuing um, and uh, um, much of that atmosphere contributed to my decision to make make a move to the Alba Party. Can I ask, are there any other Alba I mean, MPs apart from yourself? Who... Yes, so um, Kenny McCaskill, who right. is the former Justice Secretary for the Scottish Government, is uh, my colleague uh, in the Alba Party. Um, right. And, uh, you know, Kenny and I, at the moment, because of the lockdown restrictions, are working a week there and a week away so that we minimise the amount of travel uh, that we have to um, uh, do uh, as part of the COVID restrictions. So, um, uh, but we, I think we've been incredibly effective for two individuals. We've um, doubled up in some debates and been both been able to speak. Kenny had a Prime Minister's question today and um, you know, we're participating in leading debates um, uh, and that will continue. Um, those efforts will absolutely continue. You have a Northern Irish background, I know. It would be very interesting to hear what your take is on the Northern Irish protocol situation and all that. And, and the, more the atmosphere in Northern Ireland that's, the, that's behind it all. Yeah, well, I think... For that? I, yeah, I... I mean, I, I, I'm able to um, to comment on that, but it's it, it, it really is from a distance and probably because of um, my early years, I'm quite sensitive to um, that conversation being had in, in the north of Ireland. Um, it, 
you know, I, I don't know if if you managed to watch the um, BBC documentary, The Road to Partition, that, that's recently been around. And if you haven't, I would recommend it. It's thoroughly engaging, very, very interesting. And it charts the story from uh, uh, the, the late 19th century through to modern times about the uh, reasons for and the um, consequences of partition in Ireland. And uh, it's absolutely fascinating, but certainly, you know, I have still have family in the North of Ireland in Belfast. One of my cousins is a, um, a an Alliance party uh, councillor in Belfast city. And he works for Stephen Farry, who is the member of part, a member of parliament for the Alliance. Uh, and certainly from, from, informal feedback uh, from family is that you know the conversation is taking place but what you ultimately will have is a much more febrile conversation happening in the extremes of both camps um, and we've heard recently from um, uh, unionist uh, loyalist the loyalist side um, uh, beginning to make noises that violence returning is an option. And that is absolutely heartbreaking, given the massive progress that's been made on the Good Friday Agreement. But if you you, you sit the two, so the, the reasons for partition and, and, and certainly the early arguments around that, and you um, use that to inform your assessment of where things are today, um, that's unsurprising because really a lot of threatened violence came originally from the unionist uh, camp if they were going to be separated from the UK. Um, my personal view uh, uh, for what it's worth is that these conversations must um, be had in a democratic way and the decisions must be um, taken in a democratic way through uh, a, a vote of the people. There is a mechanism in place to do that uh, as part of the Good Friday Agreement. And um, I hope that uh, common sense will prevail if that is called for, but there needs to be a sustained um, and demonstrable um, appetite for that within the electorate. And I'm not sure how that will be assessed. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, it's a very, very tricky uh, period. I think everybody is asking for the, um, uh, you know, for the, the moon and the stars. And I, I, I worry that there will be um, continued disappointment in both of the polarised extremities. Um, and I really worry that that will turn into um, something hotter than we have today. Uh, you know, we can cope with vigorous and hot debate. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's very clear uh, from uh, voices like Sammy Wilson, uh, who spoke today in Parliament uh, about some of his uh, misgivings around um, the, the current situation. And he is um, uh, vociferously uh, frustrated and angry with the UK Parliament because they want to um, do away with any border control between the north of Ireland and uh, uh, Scotland and, and England. Um, but by the same token, the Good Friday Agreement demands that there is unrestricted travel between both the north and the south. And, uh, you know, th this fundamentally is, uh, you know, without being flippant, it's fundamentally a uh, problem that's been created by the British state uh, as part of their withdrawal uh, and the creation of the, uh, not all of the, uh, the, the Ulster counties, but the, 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 the remaining um, counties in the north of Ireland. And, you know, partition has been something that the British state has done in many areas. Uh, and they've even started talking about um, partition in Scotland, should we choose independence? So it's a really, I think it's a, a very un, unhelpful tool. It, you know, it happened in, in India and in, in Pakistan and uh, 
It, it, it happened in Ireland and it's happened, uh, it happened in Palestine with the creation of Israel. So there are, we know that partition is problematic and um, it makes it um, very difficult to really come to uh, a solution that meets that challenge outside of the EU. I think membership of the EU and um, the principles of the uh, European human rights uh, legislation were great enablers of the Good Friday Agreement um, and we're now in a position where that stability and that shared um, uh, framework is under threat. Uh, so I think I would be, it would be very foolhardy of me to predict the next development, um, but it is a, a very real concern. Yeah, I mean, in a way, this is a great tragedy of Brexit, isn't it? Or one of them. It is, uh, it is, it and, is. Uh, I mean, it's difficult, as you say, to see a, a way out on the basis of the way they chose to do Brexit. If they decided to stay in the single market or something like that, or a sort of EFTA type thing or a, a mild sort of Brexit, it could have been avoided. But by going to the full Monty, that's, <laughs> yeah. you ended up with, a, with an almost intractable situation. Uh, if it does, it, or it looks awfully like it's moving towards some sort of a, a new election because of the problem of um, finding a, what they call it, the leader. A new first minister, yeah. A new first minister, right. Yeah. <clears throat> Could well end up, if they don't, apparently they don't find it in a week, they've got to then go for an election. Yeah. An election could end up with Sinn Féin ending up, or at least uh, possibly in control. Then, then the unionists, are the extreme unionists are going to react very violently, I'd imagine, to that situation, aren't they? I mean, that's very likely. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, anecdotally, that's always been the fear um uh, it, within the unionist mindset is that you know and uh, and it's been expressed in extremely pejorative terms certainly if i reflect back on my early years um but the reality is that it's not just um you know it, it's not just uh a traditional um nationalist folk that are voting Sinn Féin any longer no. You know, the younger population look at Sinn Féin not through the lens that many of us were socialised into thinking about as being intrinsically linked to the IRA, but they look at Sinn Féin as a progressive party, a party of unity that's seeking to do something that lots of young people uh, are interested in, which is to continue peace and uh, have stability. Um, whether that's a, a, a realistic uh, deliverable, but they are the one party that... Um, is present uh, in in both the north and south of of Ireland, uh, and they have that um, that in their favour. I, I think um, I I don't see a circumstance where there will be a smooth transition, um, but uh, you know it really will come down to how peace is kept, um, and that will require um, more cool heads than I predict there will be. Yeah, you know, it's also in the hands of the British Secretary of State, isn't it, to decide whether there should be a referendum, uh, which it is going to be very ticklish for a Boris Johnson government, I would have thought. It, it would be, but I mean, there are there are clear parameters within that 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 um, uh, border so, poll framework. So there has to be evidence that there is a prevailing desire for a united Ireland and then the um, Irish government and the UK government need to agree that a border poll should go ahead. So um, whilst they may want to say no, it would be very difficult for them to resist internationally and with a credible position. But, you know, all that said, the current UK government's um, uh, ability to work within international law uh, is being uh, has been really damaged uh, by the threats that they've made as part of the whole Brexit process. 
Um, yeah. I think the American pressure will be very important in there, whatever, I imagine. Oh, undoubtedly, undoubtedly. And I don't think we've really seen, uh, and I don't think we're likely to see uh, the true feelings uh, and perhaps the candor that will go on in the background in public, because um, I certainly, uh, you know, would imagine, given the position that uh, President Biden has um, been very vocal about in the past, I don't think that's going to change overnight. Uh, and certainly I don't think he would be in a position to soften that too much given the strength of the Irish lobby in uh, the United States. Yeah. Okay, any questions for anybody else? Joe, yeah, I'd like to say something. Joe, yes, my apologies, Joe. my dog just escaped, so I'm very sorry about that. It's a dog. <laughs> but um, I thought that in your initial description of how you're working in Westminster at the moment, you really brought home this huge fear that I have. Of, of course, there's a fear about what's going to happen in Ireland. But the, the, the sort of unravelling of all of the checks and balances that have formed part of our democracy for so long are so frightening. You know, not responding to, yet to, to, to PMQs and, and this whole kind of undoing of judicial review and all of those things. And having such a massive majority, you know, one, one party parliaments just are very frightening, I think. And I just wonder what sort of work is going on between the opposition parties to try to bring all of that out into the open a bit more because people you know it's not being reported people are not aware of how legislation is just being stampeded through um the the both houses or else worse it's just being pushed into secondary legislation and so really detailed important legislation isn't even getting to the floor of the house yeah i i i think you're right i mean there are there are certain maxims that we have all grown up with uh, that just no longer exist in things such as if a minister has been found to break the law, then they would resign. And we've now had not just uh, breaches of ministerial code, but we've had both Matt Hancock and uh, Michael Gove um, be uh, found to have broken the law with regards to um, contracting during the COVID crisis uh, by using a VIP line to allocate billion pound or million multi multi-million pound uh, contracts to people who are very close to them. And in, in any other context, that would be a matter for immediate resignation. Um, but we've also got, we know now, because of the um, testimony of Dominic Cummings at the um, Joint Select Committee, that the um, relationship between himself and Boris Johnson and Matt Hancock at some of the most concerning um, junctures in the uh, COVID crisis was extremely poor, and that's now been supported by the WhatsApp messages that have been circulating. So... Um, we're, I think we're in completely uncharted territory, and uh, I, I think it underpins the risk of personality politics uh, and how perhaps, um, you know, the man in grey, John Major, is perhaps not such a bad, a bad idea, someone with perhaps not the most scintillating of personalities, but who understands the uh, principles of good governance and is reasonably straightforward and honest. Um, uh, you know, and even reflecting on Margaret Thatcher having the dignity to resign at the time that she did. Um, I, and you juxtapose that with where we are now. And it is really quite bewildering that, you know, someone such as Matt Hancock, who has been accused within, within his own government of being hopeless, um, uh, I think that was the that was the word that the prime minister used to, uh, uh, about him. Uh, he is kept in post, and um, you know, and we have hundred over a hundred thousand people who have died under his watch. And the only part of the COVID response that I think has been in any way impressive is the work that Kate Bingham did uh, with regards to the vaccine um, 
uh, task force and the development of vaccines. And I don't think I think anyone would be churlish if they tried to criticise her. I mean, I would criticise her for bringing with her uh, some of her um, uh, um, uh, venture capitalist uh, ideas and some of the notions about leaking information and pro profiteering. I, I find that extremely distasteful. Uh, but you can't knock her for actually delivering the goods when it came to delivering vaccines. But, you know, that is a crutch that the Prime Minister and Matt Hancock are using to support their own performance. And that, that again, is, I, I think that's a really dishonourable way to behave. Um, you know, people people will attack me because I've you know switched parties and various other reasons. But you know, at the end of the day, I haven't. Uh, I certainly haven't broken the law, and I have tried. Uh, you know, and I say this in with all sincerity. I have tried to follow my principles, uh, and move in a it, it move in a way, however reluctantly, uh, but to be able to give voice to what I believe is um, deeply concerning uh, activity at the heart of both governments. Thanks, Ed, but I mean, I think it's so important that it's not just the Dominic Cummings of this world who not that easy to believe either, that, uh, that are calling out the, the action that's been so wrong. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Good Law Project, um, uh, Joe Moylan has done a huge amount of work on the corruption uh, issues and, you know, and it's been, uh, that that was the, the action that resulted in uh, both Gove and um, Hancock being found to have broken the law. But it, it, it just becomes infuriating when such convincing and compelling arguments are pre presented to the High Court and it results in hardly even the raising of an eyebrow in government. Or in the media. Or yeah. in the media, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's... Yeah, because all of the fantastic emails that you get from the Good Law Project and all of the wonderful articles in The Guardian that John is always circulating to us, I think are to some extent just talking in their own echo chamber because we're all reading those things, but there's just so many people out there who seem to Never see them. really not question what Boris is doing because they want to believe that it's all going to get better and we can all smile and ruffle our hair and just think it'll all be fine. Yeah, and, and, and that goes back to the personality politics. I mean, Boris is the, the Dell boy of British politics and that he will always convince you that everything's going to be fine because we're British. And I, I made that comment today uh, uh, in the debate. And... And, and, and I think the fact that it's so, um, it's such a fragile and thin uh, veneer over the chaos that's going on in the background, but so many, well, two things. It's presented as okay by the mainstream media and particularly the BBC, who don't scratch at these difficult issues. I mean, after the, the, the weekend after the Good Law Project judgment came out, there was nothing about it on the BBC. You know, uh, uh, it was on the website and that was about it. it. It surely, two government ministers being found to have broken the law in their, uh, in, in public office should have been a story worth pursuing. Um, you know, I, I made indelicate comments without any intention of offence uh, about my concerns of the situation in uh, in Gaza. Uh, and I was hounded by Glenn Campbell around the country in quite an extraordinary way. Um, but government ministers who have broken the law doesn't seem to raise a, 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 an eyebrow. Um, and it's, it's bewildering. I, I haven't got an answer for you other than to say, I share your concern wholeheartedly. Well, when you have the BBC been breaking the law, from apparently, or, and, <laughs> yeah. uh, and the police have been breaking the law, so who have we got left? Uh, it's ironic that, uh, or that Europe was blamed for being run by bureaucrats and not being democratic and all this sort of thing. It was a hell of yeah. a lot more democratic in the, in the European Parliament. I had a lot more control of things than apparently any MP has in Westminster nowadays. 
and yeah. uh, that was apparently the reason we left Europe to get take back control of, by our own parliament, so we could decide and get rid of people if we didn't like them and if they broke the law. But no, no, <laughs> apparently not. Didn't we? <laughs> so there's a common, there is a common thread there, John, and that that is um, the narrative that was um, set forth by Nigel Farage, principally, but by other Eurosceptics in the Conservative Party, they were platformed so regularly and they were allowed to make assertions without evidence uh, on many occasions and they were allowed to perpetuate certain myths that then became truths, um, particularly around the European Commission and uh, which is effectively the, the um, civil service you know, that, that, that they were corrupt and there was no accounts and all of these things. And some of it might be true, but there is some explanation uh, that must sit behind that. And um, that a lot of that rhetoric went completely unchallenged. Uh, whereas if you look, for example, uh, at the Alpa party, um, our narrative doesn't suit that agenda. And so we are completely silenced. We are not given a platform. Um, and, uh, you know, the, there are real concerns about um, the media and, and certainly the new media, which became uh, uh, something, something I, I certainly uh, held in very high regard during the uh, years leading up to the independence referendum. There was a whole range of bloggers came up and the Wings Over Co Scotland site and the like. And, you know, now many of them are threatened and Craig Murray, who uh, uh, was an ambassador uh, for the United Kingdom in, um, oh, it was, I think it was Uzbekistan, it was one of the, the stands, uh, or was it Kyrgyzstan, a anyway, he, he shone a light on human rights abuses and, uh, you know, was a whistleblower uh, as an ambassador in that country, and he uh, is a, a human rights campaigner and blogger. And he's now been convicted of something called jigsaw identification, um, and there are very serious concerns that this is a politically motivated prosecution because he has been critical of the First Minister, um, particularly around her willingness to pursue independence. And, you know, uh, th there are real concerns uh, in Scotland uh, and the transparency of the Scottish government um, and what information uh, was concealed and for what true purpose it was concealed as part of the um, Salmond inquiry. So, you know, I, I, I take Joe's, Joe's point that Westminster has problems, but we also have significant challenges up here, not least that during that period I just referred to, the senior law officer, the Lord Advocate, um, is the head of the prosecutorial services in Scotland. Um, but also was a cabinet member and was very close to the first minister and um, uh, other members of the SNP. And you begin to wonder whether there is true separation of powers in Scotland. And well, there's clearly not because that 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 is the, the structure of the post. And um, I think previously uh, when Alec was first minister, he only took um, advice from the Lord Advocate when there was a legal position. The, the post holder did not sit in on cabinet meetings regularly, whereas uh, uh, Mr. Wolf, it was a, a different situation and he was a, a, a key member of the cabinet. And, you know, you know, I'm not making an accusation that, um, that there was malfeasance, but I, I think that in any of these situations, particularly in public office, if there is even the implication that malfeasance could occur, because of structural uh, uh, arrangements, then uh, it's really important that it, it is clear that the um, arrangement is transparent and open to scrutiny. And when that scrutiny is denied, then I think we're in very difficult territory. Incidentally, uh, it, interesting in that respect, of course, in Europe, one of the requirements of a membership is an independent judiciary, completely independent of government. It's why the Lord Chancellor uh, was uh, was it the Lord Chancellor? He, he used to appoint judges and things in the old days, and that's all gone. And we now have a Supreme Court in for the UK. So presumably, if Scotland were to re were to join the EU, there would have to be a rethink of the structure of the 
judiciary and the, its relationship with government in Scotland. I don't know whether that wasn't affected before, apparently. Absolutely, because the, the current uh, situation is that it's a, uh, the First Minister um, makes those appointments. And that introduces, I think, a, a governance risk that should be addressed on principle. Um, it's not really about the individuals. It really is a matter of principle that we, we need that separation of powers. It's a fundamental um, uh, part of liberal democracy that um, each strand of uh, government and governance uh, is independent, sufficiently independent to be able to hold each other to account. Right. Uh, questions? Anybody else, Paul? Uh, uh, Anthony, thanks. Good to see you there. Anthony Lodge has joined us. Yeah, um, got a question, Anthony? I've got a question. You're muted. You're muted. I'm muted. Uh, um, yeah, sorry for being late. This is, seems very interesting discussion. Uh, given Boris Johnson's recent comments about the about sovereignty and the idea of Britain, uh, the United Kingdom, being uh, on a par with France with its one and indivisible nature, mm -hmm. is it remotely possible that Johnson will allow Scotland to secede? I think that we are wanting to play by the book and we're wanting to play by the uh, de democratic processes as we're talking about here but is it conceivable that Johnson and the and, and the group around him will contemplate the secession of Scotland and can that they is, not? I can't sorry what was the last bit can they stop it can they and stop what, it? Yeah. and what would happen if they do stop it try mm. to stop it Okay, so first part of my response to that would be that because the United Kingdom has an unwritten constitution, um, it uh, is difficult to uh, respond to that with any absolute certainty because um, much of the um, constitutional uh, law if you like is based on precedent and so that that leads me to the first point which is in uh, 2012 um, when the Edinburgh agreement was signed with David Cameron and Alex Salmond um, that was the first time that a section 30 order had been uh, given uh, and so there is no formal legal precedent because it's an isolated and single event. There is a risk that should a second Section 30 order be granted that that establishes precedent and therefore that would be the only means of the Scottish people um, making their uh, views known democratically. Um, so um, there are obvious uh, um, attractions to uh, having a similar process, but there are also significant risks in regard that that, that, that then establishes a precedent that uh, the Scottish question can only be asked by with the permission of the UK government. So until such times, that's not an established precedent. So whilst I'm, I'm not giving a legal opinion, it's my view that, um, that the uh, UK Prime Minister does not have an established authority for refusal. Uh, uh, so I think that would be the, the first point that I would make. Second point that I would make is that it has previously been accepted that should Scotland send a majority of independent supporting MPs uh, to Westminster, then that would effectively trigger negotiations for withdrawal from uh, the United Kingdom. And, uh, and I would say withdrawal from, from that treaty rather than secede because it's slightly different, uh, slightly different um, uh, operation um, we are a, an established country we 
we wouldn't be seceding we would be withdrawing from a treaty of union much in the same way that brexit uh, was the withdrawal from a treaty of union now uh, there's that that is an interesting um uh, exemplar uh, to counter mr johnson's repeated refusal is that well nobody had to give you permission to hold a referendum uh, uh, you held an advisory referendum and from that advisory referendum you commenced withdrawal from uh, the EU. Uh, so there are examples uh, such as that. But in terms of the international community, I think there's a piece of work to be done about how um, those arguments are presented. And I think, certainly from my perspective, there is a need to... Um, be able to demonstrate that there's an appetite for independence again, and that's through a variety of different ways, whether at the through a, a, an election or through um, consistent opinion polls, um, uh, uh, and that can establish the a public appetite. If a petition is made to the UK government from the Scottish government says we would like to hold another referendum. Um, can we have a section 30, please? And they say, no, you can't have one. Then um, I think that would hopefully be viewed in the eyes of the inter international community that uh, an honest request has been made uh, in good faith uh, and in spite of the appetite being able to be demonstrated for that vote, it was refused. So that establishes that, well, we've tried to do it by the means that was used before and it's been refused. And I think that therefore um, mounts an argument for the consideration of other means uh, to achieve that. Now, that could be either through a plebiscite um, uh, election or um, through direct negotiation uh, uh, or holding an independence referendum uh, through the Scottish Parliament. Um, that is something that um, action by uh, Martin Keatings uh, in the courts in Scotland. He tried to establish that last year, um, uh, uh, but that was not, that didn't proceed because it was felt to be too hypothetical at the time that there needed to be a request in for that to be tested. Um, so uh, that that's slightly frustrating and I'm not quite sure where that is known as the uh, people's action, where that um, leaves us on that question. But ultimately, until such times as uh, the Scottish government make some meaningful moves to, uh, to, to, to progress towards a referendum, it really all becomes a moot point. Um, so my tactic and my um, uh, uh, colleague Kenny's tactic at the moment is that we should be um, pushing for wider devolution uh, uh, until such times as we have uh, a, a Scottish government that's willing to pursue the matter more formally. And I, 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 and I think that we need to progress down that road before we get to an end point that says, right, well, we've tried these options. These are the next ones. Part of that would be an appeal to the uh, international community on a formal basis to say our democratic right as a, as, as a country to seek nationhood is being denied. Uh, that's enshrined in, in UN, um, uh, UN charters. And so um, there certainly would be uh, plenty of examples to look at given the number of countries that have uh, gained independence since the Second World War, and they've all done so through um, sometimes very difficult means. And in the, the case of the uh, um, Czech and Slovak republics, they've done it in a very um, uh, calm and, um, and peaceful way. So there are a variety of different uh, mechanisms. I think that the what will be the, the, the fundamental driving force is uh, the outcome of um, or the, the, the continued difficulties with Brexit um, uh, and uh, as they impact, particularly now that coronavirus support is about to be withdrawn and people see the real economic damage that's been done um, as a consequence of Brexit, although that will probably be dressed up as COVID, 
um, I, I think that will begin to concentrate minds. Um, and it's a very sad position to be in, but you know, people will lose their their homes and their jobs uh, as part of that process. Uh, there is a huge dam uh, uh, of um, uh, need and building up. Um, anyone who's involved in a, a food bank uh, will know that through the pandemic, the um, numbers of people needing support fr from such services has um, risen exponentially. And many of those people uh, don't believe that they will have a job when furlough stops. So um, I think it will be, I think circumstances will conspire to drive uh, constitutional discussions across all parts of the UK uh, as people realise, and, and certainly I think we'll see in Scotland, that it's not a matter of wouldn't it be nice, it will be a, a, a case of it's absolutely essential that we have the full controls of an independent country so that we can um, manage our way out of the impact of uh, coronavirus and Brexit in a, in a way that meets the needs of our population. Is that uh, Anthony? No, that's that's a very interesting answer. Very interesting. Very good. Uh, Thank you. You mentioned the Australian deal. I mean, that is almost purposely anti-Scottish and anti-Welsh, perhaps anti-Northern Ireland even, uh, in particular. Uh, and all this five percent on Scotch whiskey is a really peanuts, frankly, irrelevant. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, it could be disastrous for 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 those for the three parts of the UK, uh, the, but that's just one example of things that are developing, which uh, make it almost looks like they're forcing Scotland to go independent. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, th I think that's a really a really good point. Uh, you know, whether it's deliberate or not, um, you know the the attitude that comes from the government benches towards any Scottish member. Um, even from others who are Scottish. So Liam Fox had a go at me today uh, about something I, I, I said that irked him. Um, and, and the whole attitude is, how dare you speak up, you chippy jock? Um, and, you know, and, you know uh, when they say that to me, I just have a, a, a quiet little smile inside thinking, I'm from Ireland, mate, so I don't know. <laughs> Um, I don't know who you're speaking to, but but you know there is an attitude that uh, you know I, I would characterise that we have a prime minister that's hostile to Scotland, and instead of taking uh, a, a path to bring the four nations of the UK together and to collaborate from the beginning of Brexit and to seek compromise and buy-in, all of that could have been done. It may have involved. EFTA membership for Scotland, it may have, you know, been uh, a much more collaborative approach in the north of Ireland about how to square that circle. Uh, and, um, it, but it could have been done in a way if it, uh, that, that was helpful, if it had been planned. But I think, you know, I, as I said before, the last time I was here, they, both Gove and, uh, uh, and Johnson looked shell-shocked the, on the morning that they 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 won that the Brexit vote because I don't think they believed that they would, I think they just wanted to be on the contrary side. Uh, and having won, you'd have thought they would then try to sort of make something more workable. But it's yeah, just... but they you know they they simply didn't have a sketch of a plan, and it's clear from uh, so many noises coming out that you know uh, Boris Johnson is not the best strategist. No. Okay, Bill, you must have a question <laughs> or a point of view. I, you know me, you know me too well, John. I know you must, uh, Bill. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've, I've always got an opinion on anything. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I've, I've found it a fascinating conversation. Really, uh, I, 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 I do worry a wee bit. I'm not nearly as sanguine as you are, Neil, about the. Um, the likelihood of the Brexit damage being exposed and therefore that being used to provide a solution, a workable solution, and almost certainly a constitutional solution. Uh, I think that uh, the, the conversation that preceded it about the, the, the inertness of the media uh, 
gives credence to to my scepticism on on that scenario, uh, which then forces me to worry about what the attitude of the international community and in particular the attitude of the of the EU since we are uh, part of the European movement in Scotland here uh, would be towards any any plebiscite which was objected to by by London um, and, and almost certainly uh, would because of the media coverage surrounding that it would could push us into a Catalan situation, which I, I don't think anybody wants. So that's that's you know that is that is a bear trap of enormous proportions. It um, is, yeah. and you know, so so I mean, my 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 concern is not to underestimate the uh, the, the needs of the EU uh, to see something which it, it can sign up to in terms of of. Uh, giving sucker almost to um, a, a, a part of the UK which is no longer become part of the UK. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think we, well, we're, we're certainly legally in very different territory to Catalonia because the constitution of Spain is um, very yeah. clearly indivisible. So uh, that makes that that creates a great barrier for their movement to progress, uh, because that has to be uh, challenged uh, successfully first before they can really progress, and that's why we have political prisoners in Spain and political exiles uh, from from Spain living in elsewhere in Europe. Um, we don't have, a, as for all the reasons I said earlier about our unwritten constitution, we don't have. Um, such guidance and but what we do have is that the acts of union were entered into voluntarily uh, uh, and so um, there's an argument there that that because uh, of um, certainly precedent that they withdraw from the EU that that and withdraw from a an international treaty such as the acts of union should be permissible should any constituent part whether it's England um, Wales or Scotland, should they decide to withdraw. So I think there's a pretty reasonable, but again, not a constitutional law expert. These are just my musings, really. Um, uh, but that's something that would need to be considered very carefully by um, uh, such uh, uh, such experts. Um, there are parts of the Acts of Union where uh, elements of Scottish life are protected, and that's the, the church, the, the courts, and, and uh, well, the law, uh, and um, education, and that's why we have those separate systems and have always had those separate systems in Scotland. Um, you know, if there were to be overreach into them, there are questions about whether that would be sufficient to um, destabilise the strength of the Acts of Union, and whether they had been undermined by overreach from the UK Parliament. Um, so all of these uh, elements uh, exist, um, but, um, you know, it, it, there, 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 there is a lot of uncertainty, but the, I think the, the very last thing that the UK government want to see is uh, the kind of scenes uh, that, well, I would hope anyway, the kind of scenes that we had in Catalonia, although I have to say that I never believed I would see something like that in a liberal democracy. Um, so that was very disheartening. Um, when the, uh, the, last, the last SNP conference, I um, put forward and led a discussion on um, the need to reach out to our European partners uh, and build strong relationships. Now that was supported by um, a, a wide uh, proportion of the membership at that time, um, including Joanna Cherry, um, and you know that was part of that were discuss was discussions that I'd had with Joanna about the relationship building that had been possible as part of the Brexit withdrawal um, committee uh, in Westminster. Now that was promptly shut down after Brexit Day. And so a lot of those relationships 
um, have been fractured uh, because the, there isn't that formal meeting regularly. But I think that once we're able to travel more widely, that has to be a priority, is that we take our concerns to European, sympathetic European ears and say, look, what is it you would ac accept? What kind of um, petition would you want to see from Scotland for you to feel um, that you would take a take a view if we were being refused um, a pathway to to statehood, and so there's a very important conversation that needs to take place within uh, at the heart of those governments, uh, and so building those relationships is going to be a, a really fundamental task as we come formally out of the current situation, uh, it's certainly something that I will be um, very keen to, to, to um, do and I'll work with anyone from any party um, to, to ensure those conversations take place. Um, but that is that is absolutely vital work and you're, you're absolutely right to, to raise that. It's essential that not just in the EU, but uh, it, also with other key international uh, um, voices, particularly in the United States and President Biden, uh, that we need to, to establish. Uh, will they be as hands off as they were previously or will they be more vocal in uh, not necessarily saying we support an independent Scotland, but what we want them to say is that Scotland must have a right to decide. Uh, um, is, is the obvious place to do that not to revisit the Keatings case? Um, there are risks associated with with all of these avenues, and um, you know, whilst I've been made aware of some of them, again, I would say, you know, off the cuff, I wouldn't really want to give an opinion um, because I'm not. Uh, constitutional expert and constitutional law is highly specialized you know I can speculate and have a chat about it but fundamentally um, it, it is complex law uh, and and certainly even some of the lawyers that I know will say well, I can't give you an opinion on that I mean I can talk about it reasonably um, comfortably because I'm not uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a member of the bar and I don't have to be, I'm not, I'm not giving legal advice, I'm expressing an opinion. Um, uh, and that's different. But, you know, in terms of getting sound legal advice, uh, you know, the, um, Martin had a great QC uh, as part of his team. Um, and, you know, it it's, it's remains an unan unanswered question. I think there is an important part of that, but even even that question, I think we need to have confidence that we've got sufficient support internationally to to get behind the pursuit of that question. I, but I think that's I guess that's my point, Neil. Is that I think the, you know, the, the there is a there's a politically um, um, warm or climate out there, but the the EU is you know. Um, it has a fetish, or, it, or, or, or actually, it's constitutionally about law. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's it's a legal framework that holds the EU together. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it, 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 that is the one sacrosanct thing, almost. Therefore, the first thing, first question I would ask if I was uh, in, in, in Brussels would be, well, why haven't you taken this case? back yeah, to yeah. court and you know you're not confident of your grounds in which case there's a problem I, well I, th I think that confidence of grounds really comes down to two things uh, with regards to the Scottish government the Scottish government not only um, were petitioners against the Martin Keaton's case um, uh, although I think they withdrew towards the end formally but they um, they were opposed to the action being taken um, and, you know, we really need willing uh, of, of the government of the day to push that kind of decision through. And they need to do that with not just the legal advice that Martin was able to have, but with that 
formal legal advice, both of the Lord Advocate and of the constitutional experts that would advise on behalf of the government. So, you know, it's, it, it, I, I think it's an important question, but it's impeded by um, a lack of appetite to answer it on behalf of the Scottish government. That's, that's my opinion. Yeah, I, I, I'm I, afraid I can't remember what the Keating's. Or I, I should know what the Keating's case was, but I, um, what, 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 what was it? And you, when was you, it? you explain it, Bill. I'll, I'll let somebody else speak for a moment. <laughs> well, uh, you, you, you've said you're not a constitutional lawyer, Neil, and I, I certainly wouldn't make that claim. But my understanding of the Keating's case is that uh, it, 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 it contests that the Scottish people, by virtue by virtue of the of the, the wording, and I can never get this the right way around whether it's the Act of Union or the Treaty of Union, uh, but by virtue of the document that was signed by the Scottish Parliament 300 or whatever years ago, um, the, the wording of that means that the Scottish people have the ultimate say about who governs Scotland. And, and that uh, you know, it's not the Parliament that's sovereign, it's the people of Scotland that are sovereign in Scotland. And that is... That that's the basis of the case. It, it goes back to the wording of, of of the of the treaty or the act back in the uh, seventeen whenever seventeen oh seven was it? Um, the and and so the question, in a sense, that that, that Neil and I are debating is is uh, if 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 that's the case, then you 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 have a legal route that you can follow. And because it's a legal, a constitutionally legal route, the EU would recognise the result of that. And indeed, the UK government would, if, if it was con con confirmed to be a legal route, the UK government would have to recognise that as, as, as being, being a way to do it. Uh, the, I suppose the question in my mind I, uh, is, is, is exactly why uh, I think Neil said that the, the case didn't really get tested in court because the it was rejected as being um, uh, unable. You know, it wasn't a real thing. It was a kind of a fantasy case. And Scottish, I know the Scottish court system well enough to know that they don't like taking on fantasy cases. They reckon they've got enough real ones. Uh, but it, 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 it now. Circumstances have now changed where it's, it has now become a real question. And I, I, I think it would be considered now. Uh, but the question, I suppose, now in my mind is why the Scottish Government opposed it. And it might have been because it was a fantasy case that they opposed it. I don't know. I just don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I think uh, all I would really add to that, because that was a pretty good exposition of what the, the situation is, but the, there's a, a, a clear distinction between... Um, sovereignty south of the border and north of the border. The uh, uh, UK Parliament or the English Parliament is sovereign, uh, but in Scotland, it's neither the Parliament, the monarch, or the courts. It is the people that are sovereign, and that's the fundament a fundamental but very distinct difference between. Um, both legal systems, and I am going to embarrass myself for not remembering which king it was who attempted to challenge the people and was defeated. Uh, and and that, was, uh, that was, I think, one of the key cases that established that it was the, the people of Scotland that were sovereign. Um, but I, 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 my, my history lesson's not coming back to me. I think in the United States, the people are sovereign too, aren't they? We the people. Yes, that, that, well, that, that, yeah, exactly, we the people, yeah. yeah. And I think that's one of the fundamental things, certainly something that we believe of in the Alpha Party, is um, that Scotland absolutely must have a written constitution, a clear separation of powers uh, that is, um, uh, again, for the people, by the people type arrangement. And it, it kind of picks up on the points that Joe was making earlier uh, uh, around how did we get to this place? And because we've no, an unwritten constitution, there's, there's nothing really to hang your concerns on. You know, you can't do this because X, Y, and Z, uh, where you have, uh, where, where as in the states, you have impeachment um, uh, as an option if there has been malfeasance in office.
Yeah, I mean, I th- uh, sorry, John, if, if I could just jump in there. The, it seems to me that one of the complicating factors here is that Scotland has a, the Scottish Parliament is still fairly young and, and indeed it, it was set up on a set of assumptions that it would always be a devolved parliament. It would never uh, be a, a parliament that was was, was, uh, was taking all the decisions and it, it was set up so that there would not be any single dominant party. Uh, that's not really the way it's worked out. Uh, so the, the, the absence of a second chamber, for example, or a, a, a revising chamber has has come you know is is now shown to be a weakness. We have this unicameral system where the separation of powers becomes much more evident. Yeah, and you know, I, I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to make excuses. I'm just, I'm just, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that these things are there and they weren't, they haven't, you know, we can't sweep them under the carpet. We've, we've not been aware of them up till now. They're now becoming more obvious. Yeah. I, I think the, the unanswered question about the ability to call a, refer- to call a referendum um, is, is impeded because there has to be an action for the question to be tested against. And so there has to, e- pardon me, either be, so you have to go through that process I spoke about a while ago where you have to petition for a section 30, have it refused, go to the Scottish Parliament, decide to put a referendum forward, proceed with the legislation, be challenged by Westminster about competency, and then it can be tested in the court. And if you haven't satisfied all of those different conditions, then it can't be tested. Uh, I think that's the problem. So when it's hypothetical, the courts are not really inclined to entertain it because its hypothetical nature means that well, you don't know what the UK government might or might not have said. You don't know what the reasons they may have given or not given are. And it just becomes far too loose uh, to be um, to be um, meaningful. And so that bounces the responsibility back to the Scottish government to ask formally for a Section 30 order and for the Prime Minister to either accept or refuse that. And I don't think we get anywhere beyond the hypotheticals without those uh, those two things. Yeah. Joe, you have a question? So Joe first, then Anthony. Yeah, there's just an interesting bit, because I, I, like John, couldn't remember anything about the Keating case, so I quickly um, Googled it. And, and there is a, an interesting little quote on the bit that I'm looking at, which actually comes from the Press and Journal, where Lord Carloway took the opportunity to give his preliminary thoughts once they uh, disposed of the case on, on procedural grounds. Yes. And he said, were the court to have been of the view that it ought to have answered the questions asked, it would have done so as a matter of straightforward statutory interpretation. So the powers of Holyrood are to be assessed by considering the exact wording of the Scotland Act, the 1998 Scotland Act, Yes. This is the orthodox legal view that as the Holyrood Parliament is a creature of statute, that creature only has the powers conferred upon it by the omnipotent Westminster creature. But on the issue of the competence of Holyrood to authorise Indiref to the court remarked, the question would have been whether an act to hold a referendum on Scottish independent, independence relates to the union of the kingdoms of Scotland and England or the Parliament of the United Kingdom. So that's the really critical question, which yeah. I, I um, think is still completely up for grabs. It, oh, it absolutely is. There's yeah. no certainty. I mean, the, the Keating's, the Keating's uh, outcome didn't rule it out. All it said was, yeah. we can't make a judgment because we haven't got. Yeah. We need a real. We need a real situation yeah. to judge but again. Interesting. I mean, that that that's a very very um, naughty legal question. To it is, ask. and it com- becomes even more nuanced when you consider the um, outcome of the. Um, oh God, I can't remember the the name, but the um, process that we went through after Indiref. The name has just gone right out of my head. I want to call it Calman, but that was the one before. Um, but the, the, the process of uh, further devolution mm. will pop into my head in a moment. But um, within that agreement, said there is that this 
um, this further devolution agreement does not prevent Scotland from seeking uh, uh, independence at some future date. So there are there are elements of those amended parts of the Scotland Act um, uh, from uh, the forgotten his name commission. Uh, I'm going to have to just check that. Wasn't Smith, was it? Sorry? Wasn't Smith, was it? No, it was. Oh, God. That is really embarrassing. I'm really embarrassed <laughs> to forget. It's one of those things that just um, I know and I talk about all the time and I've just, I'm getting, all, getting on and I'm a bit more forgetful <laughs> than I used to be. Um, I think was two was it, can I quickly bat in? in was the, it was the Smith Commission, wasn't it? Was it the Smith? I thought so. Yeah, I think you're. I think you're right. I'm. I'm getting too panicky about not knowing it. Uh, uh, yeah, it was the Smith Commission. I'm sure. Carry on. Sorry. Now that you, now that I say it out loud. <laughs> I don't remember it at all. Um, yes, it was. That was the response to the vow. Um, so, but you know, it was a case of promise the earth and deliver very little. Um, that's not been helped by the fact that we've not taken up every opportunity that was uh, provided. Um, uh, with a, the, the kind of vigour that we, we should have done. But that was part of the output of the Smith Commission was very a very clear statement that Scotland would be able to reconsider its constitution, constitutional yeah. future at any time in the future. So I think the, the um, original uh, um, Scotland Act and the uh, subsequent legislation attached to the Smith Commission need to be read together and I think that's a really important statement uh, because you know there's nowhere in the Smith Commission and there's nowhere in any formal agreement the Edmund agreement of a once in a generation situation uh, and harken back to what we were talking about earlier about Ireland um, the within the Good Friday Agreement the term of revisiting a border poll referendum is every seven years. So there is an exemplar in law uh, that I've certainly tested um, much to the horror of my conservative colleagues in Parliament that, you know, well, we've got an, an example of how often these kinds of things should be tested. They don't really like that, but um, it, it is there in UK statute. Anthony, you had a point you wanted to raise? All right. Uh, yes, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes you're on. Right. Right. Good, good. Uh, listening to this discussion, it seems to me that um, the, 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 an article in today's Guardian is really rather apposite. It makes a, a rather scary uh, distinction between treating the question of British Constitution and relationship with Europe purely in legal terms, which is what we've been doing this evening, Mm -hmm. um, cuts no ice with the present regime. The present regime sees itself, according to this article, maybe even the leader article, sees itself as a sort of popular revolutionary movement backed up by the media and that they feel able and indeed entitled to um, steamroller through anything that they want to do. He's arguing that it's rather pointless trying to raise these legal issues, just as it's difficult for the Europeans to cope with a person like Johnson, because there, as has been said this evening, that is a legal framework and legal issues are at the, at the core of it all. But the, the Guardian this morning is suggesting that the present regime has, has gone way beyond that and sees itself more as a sort of revolutionary popular movement rather than uh, something bound by uh, legal niceties. Yeah. And that, that's, I mean, a, a really good example of that is the um, now multiple occasions where um, Number 10 has leaked announcements to the media, has given a media briefing before they've come to the House to, uh, to, to inform us. And a lot of us find out from Sky TV instead of from the Prime Minister in the chamber. And, and it's a real flagrant disregard for procedure. Uh, and respect for Parliament. I, I, it was a point that I made today in uh, in my contribution to the um, uh, public health debate, uh, uh, which is that you know the Parliament, uh, the the, the um, 
government no longer regards scrutiny by parliament as an important element of, uh, of governance. And um, uh, um, Liam Fox uh, was, I think, uh, he, he, although he tacked me on a completely different point, I think he was really miffed when uh, I corrected him uh, on uh, decrying professionals uh, who were raising their concerns in the media, who are members of SAGE, uh, as almost traitorous, and uh, you know, it's like so they won't, e they don't even want scrutiny in the media by experts of their disastrous decisions. Well, this is really very alarming, potentially it's extremely well, alarming. I think I think we are in the hands of demagogues, and I mean, I think <laughs> that's absolutely. It's it's very like Athens in four hundred and thirty BC, was it? With, was led into the war against uh, in Sicily, which was disastrous, ended up in the destruction of Athens. <laughs> so, I mean, it, this can happen, and it was all led by demagogues. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm afraid who disregard the niceties of you know, democratic control and so forth. Uh, I'm afraid we are in a very dangerous situation. What I was going to ask, you mentioned about the people in Scotland. Uh, when Winnie Ewing reconvened the Scottish Parliament in 1979. She said, the Parliament that, that uh, stopped in 1707 is now being reconvened. Was it in fact the same Parliament or was it a different Parliament? Because uh, presumably the Parliament of 1707 could pos potentially uh, reenact or take a decision to go back on itself. But this is the present Scottish Parliament actually that Parliament or is it a completely different mechanism set up by London, essentially. Um, I, I would be spinning a yarn if I was to give a definitive answer on that, but it's a really interesting question, not one that I've got an answer for tonight, I'm afraid. No. It's, yeah, it is a, when you say the, the people, uh, and uh, then how do we get to the people uh, completely independently of something legalistic out of London. Is there any other way? Um, well, you know, the, the I think the disregard for the law has been extremely apparent um, from from Westminster, whether that's breaching international law or um, being indifferent to ministers who have broken the law. Um, it's it's it, it is. You know, it, it's a very destabilizing position to be in because all of the certainties of a liberal democracy begin to crumble when you think, well, so, you know, who's allowed to break the law and who's not? Um, you know, and that, 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 so that's a worry. And then, you know, the, the, the concerns floating around in Scotland where um, people who have been critical of the First Minister have um, been... Um, arrested and charged, uh, sometimes on completely spurious grounds. And then, you know, we have the situation with Craig Murray. And whether it's true or not, if it gives uh, an impression of political retribution, um, then that's a very, very difficult place to, to operate in. And, you know, I, and I, I, you know, I say this part in jest and, and part with a, a, a tone of seriousness, but, you know, um, the First Minister is well known to be a, a, a challenging taskmaster, hardworking and expects a lot from those around her. Um, but, uh, you know, we used to joke that, um, you know, if you, uh, if you, you know, if you, if you said that around the First Minister, you might end up in jail. And, uh, but I don't laugh about that anymore. <laughs> Which is well, I, I, I'm laughing about it now, but it's um, you know it, it's a worrying situation when something such as that, uh, the notion of political prisoners in somewhere like Scotland, is is truly terrifying. I mean, just as it was when it happened in Spain, I, I, it, it destabilizes, and um, certainly one of the problems that I had, it was preventing me from being frank and honest, and um, you know I, I think that that people should expect their politicians to not to mince their words and not to give them platitudes. I think we're all grown-ups. We'd much rather have a proper discussion such as the one we're having tonight. Um, I th obviously, there will be sensitive issues that need to be treated as such. But when it comes to the general political 
uh, landscape, I think we should be grown up about it. I think there's been far too much politicking by soundbite and overpromising and overconfidence and you know, um, not being a nationalist about this, that they, you know, they, I, th I would say that the uh, Prime Minister, a lot of his rhetoric is British bulldog um, uh, and very nationalistic. And um, yeah, I don't think that that kind of populism is a good place to be. No. Okay, it's eight o'clock. We're going to have to call this bring this to an end, Neil. You've done a great, it's been a fantastic evening, actually. I'm just sorry there weren't more of us here, but I'm sure it'll excite quite a lot of interest when it gets recorded around the country. Uh, well, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. Well, I, we'll have to do it again. We will, indeed. Uh, I just would add one little thing from my background in, in, the, in the European Parliament. Scotland has a very, very particular uh, standing with uh, the European pol political environment. Uh, I mean, it was quite incredible how much uh, Scotland seemed to rate above any other part of, of the UK in terms of its relationships. And uh, mm -hmm. so I, although I quite agree that it's got to be a legal uh, basis for any uh, access to independence and then to rejoining Europe, mm -hmm. the politics, I think, will be very much in our favour. And just an example of that, one of my close colleagues on the Economic Committee, Vice President with me, was Garcia Magallo, who was the foreign minister, then went on to being the foreign minister of Spain during all the previous arguments about this. And I asked him once or twice, well, are you on our side? And he said, absolutely. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think there'll be any great problems, even from the Spanish, which we always hear about. But anyway... Yeah. Uh, so I just like to say the politics are certainly could be in our favour, and we, as you were suggesting earlier, we've got to make sure we foster those relationships and keep them yeah. up and, and build on them. And it's vitally important that no matter what Johnson does about Scotland's foreign relations, that uh, we do maintain our relationships uh, both at a uh, official level, but more particularly at a political level with yeah. MEPs, MPs in other countries, and so on. That's very important, and I, I hope you and your colleagues will make a point of that, if you would. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Okay. Any other points quickly before we stop? Do you want to talk about anything on Fight for Europe when we, after Neil, we let Neil